in whom we have redemption through his blood, Amen. the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Amen. Amen. Hadn't the music been good this week? Amen. And I certainly appreciate that. Thank you, ladies. And uh, that was certainly a blessing. Tonight I want to talk about and preach to you on the subject of the key to lasting relationships. You know, a lot we, we're in a time where we like keys, amen? And keys to this or keys to that, but we might say, what is the key? And I've had many people ask me and come up to me after I've preached or doing conferences and say, preacher, if you could put your finger on one thing, what would be the key to lasting relationships? Well, tonight I want to share with you what I believe is that key. Turn with me, if you would, to Mark chapter 12 and verse 28. Mark chapter 12. Look with me, if you would, at verse 28. And again, I'd ask you, if you were able to, to stand in honor of the Word of God as we read the Word of God. Verse 28, and I will read down through verse 31. Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through verse 31. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than, than these. As we pray again tonight, I'd ask you if you'd reach over and hold hands to that person next to you as we pray as a family tonight and ask God's blessings upon his precious word. Father, we humbly come before you, and Lord, we rejoice in you tonight. We thank you, God, even as these ladies sang tonight about the cross, sang about the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, help us, I pray, God, to never, ever get over our salvation. Father, help us to always glory in the cross. Yes. Father, help us, Lord, I pray, God, to rejoice and thank you continually in our heart for all that you have done for us. We rejoice in our salvation tonight, and we thank you for that. Lord, I pray tonight, in Jesus' name, God, that you would speak to our hearts through your Holy Spirit. God, I pray tonight that you would draw that one or several that may be here tonight that do not know Christ to you and that tonight might be the night of salvation for them. Yes. Father, I pray for revival in our hearts tonight. True revival would be stirred in our hearts tonight. Lord, as we look at the Word of God, Father, and we see the truths in this passage, Father, break our hearts afresh, I pray, in our relationship with you. Help us to love you above every other love in this world. And Father, I pray, God, that you would help me tonight, help me to say those things would only need to be said, and exactly what you would have me to say by your Holy Spirit. I give myself afresh to you. And I pray against Satan and all the demonic forces of hell that would try to distract us tonight. I pray, God, that you would hedge around this church, there'd be no distractions. And, Father, that we would give our full attention to the Word of God. Father, help us to be a changed people when we leave. We want to thank you in advance for all that you're going to do. If we pray, we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. As I unpack these verses tonight, I want you to first look with me, if you would, the object of our love, the object of our love. It's very interesting as we look at this passage, and perhaps you've heard it preached on before, it's very interesting that we often open part of this passage and the answer that Jesus gives to the scribe who came to him and said, Master, what is the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus gives his answer, but he gives his answer starting by going back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 is called the Shema verse in Judaism. And the word Shema means to continually hear, to hear what I'm saying, God, over and over and over and over again. This was a very, very important verse in Judaism and so Jesus goes back and he picks this verse, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, and he starts his answer to this scribe 
with this particular verse because God wants us to understand that we cannot understand what love is until we remember who God is. We cannot have a true understanding of what love is until we first remember who God is and what the object of our love should be. So Jesus goes back and he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The foundational principle that I believe that Jesus is bringing out here is that God is a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one God, three persons in one. But you might say, preacher, what does this have to do with love? Well, if there is no God, then love is just a chemical reaction or an evolutionary concept. And that's certainly what the world would have us believe today. If there is no God, then love has to be the result of some evolutionary concept or some type of chemical reaction, as the world would say. If God, listen folks, if God is a modalistic God, you say, preacher, what do you mean by that? Some believe that God is a modalistic God. God sometimes appears as God the Father. Sometimes God appears in another mood as God the Son. And at other times, he might appear as God, the Holy Spirit. There are three persons, but they're not three persons in one. This is a modalistic view of God. There was a book that came out several years ago, and a movie that came out, I think, last year for that book called The Shack. I'm sure you've heard of it. It became very, very famous. And really, in this book, it presents God as a modalistic God, where God appears sometimes as God the Father, sometimes as God the Son, and sometimes as God the Holy Spirit. You say, preacher, why is it important that God is not a modalistic God? Because love requires more than one relationship. Amen? That is, to have a loving relationship, you've got to have more than one person. And God is not one person. God is three persons. Amen? So to have love, you've got to have multiple persons in a relationship, and God has always existed as a triune God. There is one God in three persons who know and love each other and have known and loved each other from all eternity past, and they continue to do that today. Amen? Amen. Augustine said this, I think very eloquently. He said, I want you to realize that unless you have a triune God, love is not the ultimate reality. Community is not the ultimate reality. Love is not intrinsic to the universe. It came in later. But creation is this. There was a community, and they knew and loved one another from all eternity. There was a circle of love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they were delighting in each other's being. And they were praising each other's glory. They were enjoying each other's beauty. And they were pouring love into one another's bosom. One day, they said, let's expand this circle of love. Let's expand this community. Let us create things or beings who can become part of our circle of love. What a beautiful statement that is. C.S. Lewis says it this way. He said, in Christianity, God is not a static thing, but a dynamic, pulsating activity, a life, almost kind of a drama, almost, if you would not think me irreverent, a kind of dance. You're saying, preacher, what does he mean by that? He is saying that the three persons of God have always existed in a relationship of, here's a big word today, in a relationship of community where each person of God is continually giving selfless love and glorifying the other person of God. Jesus wants us to first understand that God is a triune God of love and as the Bible states, in essence, that is who God is. In essence, God is love. Therefore, before Jesus further expounds on love, he wants us to understand and be reminded that God is love. And God made man, folks. God made man to love him. And God made man to glorify him and join him in this beautiful community in creation, or as C.S. Lewis says, this beautiful dance of love that the Trinity of God has enjoyed from all eternity. God made the first married couple, Adam and Eve, to commune with him, to join him in the Garden of Eden, daily join him in this circle of 
of love, this dance of love, as they fellowshiped with him day by day in the cool of the day. A.W. Tozer says this, God's purpose in creating Adam and Eve is summed up in what they could do for God that nothing else in the whole creation could do. They had an exclusive on God shared by no other of God's creation. Unlike everything else in this mystic and marvelous creation, Adam and Eve could worship God, and God anticipated that worship. In the cool of the day, God came down and walked with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden where they joyously offered their reverence and adoration. Nowhere do we read that God came down free, walked with any animal, created, nor did he talk to any of the animals, only able to provide the fellowship God desired. It was their unique purpose, shared by nothing else in all of God's beautiful creation. And let me say here tonight, that's still God's desire for you and I. I think of Ephesians chapter, six, chapter 1 and verse 4 where God says, He hath chosen us before the foundation of the world that, or why, we should be holy and blameless. Look at what it says, before Him in love. We would join Him in this loving relationship. He has chosen us to salvation that we might be holy and blameless and join Him in this community of love that the Trinity has enjoyed from all eternity. Having talked about the object of love, Jesus moves on and talks about the obsession of our love. Look at verse 30. The obsession of our love. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. You say, preacher, if there's a key word in that verse, what do you think would be the key word? Well, in my opinion, as I look at this verse and I meditate upon this verse, I took my pen and I circled one particular word in this verse several times, and that one word is all. That is, God doesn't want part of you. God doesn't want a little bit of you. God wants all of you. Amen? He wants every fiber of our being. God wants all of us to worship Him. He wants us to love Him supremely and preeminently above every other love in this world. Amen. I remember years ago when I first got out of college, Debbie and I were about 22 years old, and somebody, a, a man that we did not know at a, at a Baskin Robbins ice cream place came over and introduced himself to me. I didn't know that he was going to invite me to a multi-level marketing business. But he did. He called me later, and we decided to go to a meeting and look at this multi-level marketing business, and we really didn't care that much about the money at that time or anything else. We just wanted some good Christian friends, so we got involved in this business. But I found out very quickly, if I was going to be successful in this business, I was going to have to get totally out of my comfort zone. That is, I was going to have to build a list, they told me. I needed to get a hundred names on my list as soon as I possibly could. A hundred people on my list. And I thought, I'm in Kingsport, Tennessee. I just took a new job here. I don't know anybody around here. How in the world am I going to get a hundred names on my list? And Debbie can tell you, she's my witness here tonight, that I was very, very bashful. I wouldn't leave my Sunday school in silent prayer. I mean, I wouldn't speak in front of nobody. She can tell you that. 22 years old. But because I wanted to become a millionaire before I turned 30, <laughs> because I wanted to be successful in this multi-level marketing business, you know what I did? I started to meet people. I went to Wendy's. Somebody would be in front of me. I'd tap them on the shoulder, and I'd say, Hey, did you go to Virginia Tech? And you know what? They would turn around. I'd hold up my hand, and they would shake my hand. They'd say, Well, no, I didn't go there. I said, My name is Sam Wood. What's your name? And I met that person, got their telephone number, and I put them on my list. I would go down to a men's store because I, I can probably meet some pretty sharp people down the men's store, guys, down there. And so I went to the men's store and I'd see somebody over looking at a suit and I would go over to where that person was. I'd edge around to them and I'd say, listen, did you happen to go to Virginia Tech? You look like somebody that, I, that reminds me of somebody I might have saw there. And they said, no, I didn't, I didn't go there. I said, well, listen, my name is Sam Wood. What's your name? And I would, listen, I'd shake his hand, get his name, put him on my list. 
and I start getting names on my list, and I started accumulating a list, and I start calling these people up, and I start inviting them to my home to see this multi-level marketing business. And we did this for several years, got several hundred people in our group. I began to travel around the country and do these meetings totally out of my comfort zone. And then one day, when God called me into the ministry, one day the Holy Spirit began to work on me. And the Holy Spirit began to say this to me. He said, Sam, how is it that you can go down to Wendy's and meet people and share a business with them? And you can go over to the men's store and meet people and put them on your list and share a business with them, but you never meet anybody and tell them about Jesus Christ. I got into conviction. I thought, you know what? I've let this other love take place of the main love, and that is my love for Jesus Christ. And God used that and convicted my heart when I got into ministry. And I'm not saying all multi-level marketing businesses are bad. I'm not here tonight to say that. But at that point, I got out of it because I didn't want to go out in churches and preach and be everywhere with people thinking or in back of my mind thinking, that would be a good person in my business. That would be a good person in my business. I mean, my upline thought, man, I've really got somebody now. He's a preacher. He's traveling around. He'll have people all over the country in it. And I thought, I can't do that. My focus needs to be on Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, look at how this works out. Look at what Jesus says. He tells us what this looks like, how we are to love Him. First, He says to love Him with all of our heart. That means to love Him with all of our affections. God is to be the supreme affection of your life. We're to desire Him more than any other lover in this life. Our hearts are to yearn for Him. Our hearts are to thirst for Him. Our hearts are to hunger for Him. I love what David says in Psalm 27 and verse 4. He says, one thing, one thing have I desired of the Lord. You say, what is that, David? That will I seek after, he says, that I will dwell <laughs> I'll dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. He said, there's one thing more than any other thing I want in my life. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord, and I want to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Amen. I want to gaze on His beauty. Amen. Paul said it this way in Philippians 3.10, that I might, what church? Know Him. That I might know Him. I love what Tim Keller says about that. He says, knowing God is when the truth overflows the mind into all the rest of you. Your rationality goes ballistic. You can't keep it inside of you. The truth moves from something you understand to something you stand under. Knowing God is truth becoming radioactive. <laughs> I love that. And I believe that's what Jesus is saying. Knowing me Loving me with all your heart, all your affections, is to love me radioactively through every fiber of your being. In fact, in another place, Jesus says that God is to be so much the affection of our heart that I am to have more affection for Him than I even have for my wife, that I even have for my children. I remind you what it says in Luke 14, 26. If any man come to me, Jesus says, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his life also, he cannot be my disciples. You say, preacher, is Jesus saying I'm to hate my wife? I'm to hate my children? I'm to hate my brother and sister? What Jesus is saying is your love for them compared to your love for me should look like hate. That is, you should love me so supremely, you should love me so affectionately that the love you have for me compared to the love you have for anything else should look like hate. And Jesus knows this, folks. Listen, if I'm loving him that way, I'm going to love my wife right too. Amen? I'm going to love my children right too. Do you love him with all of your affections? The psalmist said, taste and see that God is good. Listen, folks, God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in Him. Amen. So firstly, 
Jesus says, we're to love Him with all of our heart, all of our affection. Secondly, He says, we're to love Him with all of our soul. What that means is we're to love Him with all of our life. With all of our life. We're to love God more than we literally love our own life. If we're called to die for the glory of God, to become a martyr for God, our love for Him should be so supreme, it should be so great that we would gladly die for the cause of Christ. Many have gone before us who have loved God with all their life. I think of men like William Tyndale, John Huss. I think of Jim Elliott. I think of James and Peter and Paul and John who gave their life, literally gave their life uh, for Christ. I think of a missionary. I'm reading a book right now by the name of John Patton who was a missionary in the South Seas to the cannibals who went down there and the first island he was on there, he lost his wife and he lost his son. Later, he lost his life. I, I think of, as I read these stories of these great men and women of God who literally go out and they say, God, here I am, use me. If it means my life, I'll give my life for the cause of Christ. And friends, listen today. I don't think we think about it enough, but every day, I get up in the morning every day, I try to remind myself, I have brothers and sisters all around this continent, all around this world who are being killed, who are being persecuted for the cause of Christ, over 400 a day around the world right now. I don't know their names. I don't know who they are, but I want to pray for them Amen. because God knows who they are. And God sees where they are, and God sees the persecution that they're going through and as brothers and sisters in Christ. I need to pray for them. We must be ready to give up our house, our home, our liberty, our friends, our comfort, our joy, and literally, if God calls us to, even our life, or we have not obeyed this command. Oh, we're to love Him, Jesus says, with all of our affections, all of our heart. We're to love Him with all of our soul, all of our life, but we're to love Him with all of our mind. That means all of our intellect. All of our intellect, we are to love God. I believe this is a command to think about God in your mind. Pursue knowledge and understanding of God more than we pursue anything else in this life. It's to read and study your Bible and books that will help you better understand the doctrines of God. It's to search out God, as it says in Proverbs, as hidden treasure. Amen. And I want to tell you here tonight, there's a lot of hidden treasure right here. There's a lot of good nuggets right here just to keep searching it out, keep reading the Word of God, keep finding out what God has to say to us through the Holy Spirit. Listen, it's to delight in God more than I delight in getting up in the morning and reading a magazine, more than I delight, listen, in watching TV or watching a movie, more than I delight in watching a sporting event on television or reading about it on the Internet. It's not saying those things are bad, but listen, God ought to be the priority in my mind. Or I'm not loving Him with all of my mind. Then he says we're to love God with all of our strength. What that means, with all of our activity. Listen, I'm to love God. You're to love God actively, not passively. Amen? We're to worship Him actively, not passively. I'm to serve God and not just sit by and watch other people serve God. I'm to in, get involved in the work of God myself. I'm not to be a spectator. I'm not to sit on the bleachers. I'm to get involved in the church, and I'm to get involved in soul winning. I'm to get involved in witnessing. I'm to get involved in teaching. Whatever God calls me to do in the church, that's what I should do. Amen. I love what Spurgeon says. He says, I'm to throw my whole soul into the worship and adoration of God. I'm not to keep back a single hour or a single farthing of my wealth or a single talent that I have or a single atom of my strength, bodily or mental, from the worship of God. I am to love Him with all of my strength. And folks, Jesus is saying here, the greatest commandment of all is we're to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. C.S. Lewis says, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy. The most probable explanation is I was made for another world, something supernatural and something eternal. 
And folks, we were made for another world, and nothing in this world will satisfy your heart, your soul, like Jesus Christ. Amen. To sum up this first command of Jesus, he's talking about worship and idolatry. There's to be nothing that comes between myself and my Savior. Amen. I'm reminded of the words of Charles Tenley's hymn, Nothing Between. You know these words, nothing between my soul and my Savior. Not of this world's delusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine. There's nothing between. Nothing between my soul and my Savior, so that his blessed face may be seen. Nothing preventing the least of his favor. Clear the, clear the way clear. Keep the way clear. Let nothing between. Amen. Amen. You see, it's all about loving God first and foremost. Jesus, I believe, gives us a great example of what this all means in the story he gives us in Luke chapter 18. Turn there with me, if you would, for just a moment tonight, and verse 18 of the rich young ruler. Luke chapter 18 and verse 18. Look at it with me for a moment tonight. In verse 18 of Luke chapter 18, it says, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master... What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I want you to get the picture here. Here's a very rich, a very wealthy young man who's very, very successful. He's accomplished a whole lot in his life. I'm sure if you could see his resume, he had a very long resume. If we were to put this into contemporary terms of today, we might say this is a very, very successful stockbroker, maybe in New York City. He's a young man, maybe in his 30s. He drives a BMW. He comes down the road, and he's got his briefcase. He's got his portfolio out. He's, got, he's accomplished so much in his life at such a young age. He's accomplished wealth. He's accomplished social status. He's got about everything, but he comes up and drives up and gets out the car, and he comes up to Jesus Christ, and he says these words, these words in verse 18. He says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You see, he's used to doing things to get what he wants. And I circle those words, what shall I do? Because we live, listen folks, we live in a day and time in America today where people are asking that same question, what can I do to inherit eternal life? What do I need to do to get to heaven? And let me just answer that here tonight. There's nothing you can do. Jesus has already done it, amen? Amen. What you need to do, if anything, is trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He has done it all. That's right. Listen, folks, God doesn't grade on a bell curve. You can be a good person. You can give of your tithes and offerings. Listen, you can be benevolent. You can be good to your husband, good to your wife, a good dad, a, a good mom. But God doesn't grade on a bell curve where this person gets to go to heaven because of their works and this person don't because they don't have to go to works. It's not a what you do is not about what I do. It's about what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. Amen. But he comes to him and says, what shall I do? And Jesus said to him in verse 19, why callest thou me good? None is good save one that is God. I love that. Jesus says, son, listen, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. Don't you realize you're not talking to just a good person. You're talking to God. You're talking to God in flesh. I am Jesus Christ, the Messiah. I am God incarnate. I'm not just a good teacher. I am God himself. And so Jesus corrects that in verse 19. And then he says this in verse 20. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. So Jesus starts with all of the commands that have to deal with their horizontal relationships of man to man. He said, you know the commandments. Don't commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, don't bear false witness, don't lie, and honor your father and mother. And look at the response of this young man in verse 21, and he said... You know, and I just can imagine being on the scene with this young man talking to God in flesh, Jesus Christ, and saying these words, I have kept all these from my youth. I thought, no, you have not. That would be my answer. Liar, you haven't done that. 
You're saying you never told a lie. You've always honored your mother and father. But this young man, he's filled with his good works. I've done all these things, God, from my youth. Jesus, I'm a good person. Don't you know how good that I am? Then look at verse 22. Now Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And look at this youngest man's response in verse 23. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful because he was very rich. You see, Jesus moves the conversation into one about worship and idolatry. Jesus says, but you lack one thing, young man, Jesus is getting to the heart of God's commandments. He is asking this young man, what do you love more than God? We're going to see where your heart is. We're going to see what you love preeminently and supremely in your life. This man was worshiping the wrong God. He was worshiping the God of money. He was worshiping the God of social status. This man was very rich, so he, didn't, he wasn't willing to do what Jesus said. He went away very sorrowful. And Jesus is saying to him, let me put the finger on the idol in your life. Now let me stop and say this. I said this in the Q&A session, and I'll say it again tonight. Even a good thing, even a good thing, can become a bad thing if it takes place of the best thing. Amen. You see, folks, there's a lot of lesser loves in our life that are not necessarily bad. Money in and of itself isn't bad. We use money to do wonderful things for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Money in itself isn't bad. Sports in itself isn't necessarily bad. <coughs> Sex certainly isn't bad. God created it. But a good thing can become a bad thing if it takes place of the best thing. It is, sex is beautiful, but sex is designed for marriage. And a good thing called sex can become a bad thing if sex is participated outside of marriage, if it takes place of the best thing where God designed for it in marriage. This man, listen, this man was finding his identity in his social status, his riches, his lifestyle. So Jesus says, okay, sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and we will see exactly what you worship. Let me stop right here and make a statement that I think is a very important statement to understand. I've been in family ministry, I told you tonight, for 25 years. We've counseled hundreds of people. And I just want to make this statement tonight. Every counseling problem that a person has is a worship problem. Every counseling problem is a worship problem. Something in their life has taken place of God. And so you've got to find what is that that's taken place of God. This man left very sad because he was very rich. I want to ask you a question here tonight. This is revival. This is the last night of revival. God laid this message on my heart. This is a revival message. What would you be unwilling to give up in order to follow Jesus? What would you be unwilling to give up in your life in order to follow Jesus? Let me say this. We often, listen folks, we often do not know what idol is in our life until we face the prospect of losing it. See, this young man didn't know what was controlling his life until he faced the prospect of losing it. Jesus sell, said, sell all you have, come and follow me. When he faced the prospect of losing the idol in his life, he realized then, it opened his eyes, that's what I'm worshiping. And folks, listen to me tonight. We have to search our hearts. One theologian said our heart is like an idol factory. We continue to manufacture little idols in our heart continually all the time. Little lesser loves, if we're not careful, that will take place of the supreme love we should have for Jesus Christ. It's only when we have that supreme love and we're loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength that we personally experience revival in our life. We personally experience revival in our churches. We often do not know, folks, what idol is in our life until we face the prospect of losing it. What is it in your life 
that you would be unwilling to give up to follow Jesus. This is what happened to this rich young ruler. You say, preacher, how can I love God? Then with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, with all my mind. Let me give you a simple answer. In and of yourself, you can't. In and of yourself, you won't. But look back with me at Luke chapter 18. And look at verse 24. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? Now love the next verse. And he said, The things which are impossible with men, thank God, are possible with God. Jesus came to this earth to save us, to seek and save those who are lost, to rescue us and deliver us from our depravity, from our sin, from the dominion of sin unto salvation, out of the darkness into the light. Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, Paul says, Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Amen. Hallelujah. Notice with me, turn back if you would to our text in Mark chapter 12. And notice the word first at the end of verse 30. At the end of verse 30, the word first there that he said, this is the first command. This is the first command. Jesus says that. This is the first command. Why? Because all of the rest of the commands, folks, listen. All of the rest of the commands of God are encompassed in this one command. Martin Luther said it this way, we break the rest of the commandments only after we have broken the first two. We cannot obey the rest of God's commands without first obeying this command. This leads me to my last point. We've talked about the object of love. We've talked about the obsession of love. Look with me lastly at the overflow of love. Look at verse 31. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. You know what Jesus is saying? He's saying until you are obsessed with God's love, you'll not overflow with his love to others. Until we're completely obsessed with the love of God, loving Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, our love will not overflow to others where we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Paul said in Romans 13, 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth, listen to this, folks, he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Wow. Wow, if you love your neighbor, you fulfill the law. Then he says in verse 9, For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended or summed up in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love, in verse 10, worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So Paul says love. If you love God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself, if you're so obsessed with God's love, then that love will overflow. It can't help but overflow to those around you, your neighbors around you. There's no greater command than these two commands, and when you do that, you're fulfilling the whole law of God. There's an inseparable link between loving your neighbor and loving God. We will not, folks, listen... We will not love right horizontally until we're first loving right vertically. Amen. Until we love God right, Amen. we will not love others right. <laughs> Lloyd Jones says, when God controls our hearts, we have ceased to be governed by self. When the love of God comes in, the love of self goes out. And when the love of self goes out and the love of God comes in, we then begin to love others. You can't help it. Amen. You can't help but loving others. When we're obsessed with loving God, we will overflow with His love to all those 
around us and especially, listen folks, especially in our family. Husbands will not love and lead their wives correctly if they're not loving God correctly. Wives will not submit to their husbands correctly until they're loving God correctly. Amen. Parents will not nurture and bring up their children, the nurture and admonition of the Lord, as I talked about last night. They won't love their children correctly until they're first loving God correctly. Amen. And children, listen to me tonight. You will never be able to obey and honor your parents the way God commands you to, the way I've talked about this week. You'll never be able to do that correctly until you're first as a child loving God correctly. It all comes down to who and what do you love. Who or what do you love? Who or what are you worshiping in your life? Do you love God? I ask you tonight, this is the closing service of this revival. Do you love God? Be honest tonight. As the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts tonight, do you love God with all your heart, all your affections? Do you love God with all your soul, all your life? Do you love God with all your mind, all your intellect? Do you love God with all your strength, all your activity? Is God the supreme, preeminent love of your life tonight. That's the key to revival. And that's the key to having lasting relationships as a husband and wife, as a mom and dad with your children, as brothers and sisters in Christ. We will only love each other rightly when we love God rightly. Bow your heads tonight. Heads about eyes are closed. Heads about eyes are closed tonight. I asked you a question, several questions a few moments ago. What is it in your life that you'd be unwilling to give up to follow Jesus? If Jesus came to you tonight and he is coming to you tonight through the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart and putting his finger and speaking to you like Jesus spoke to this rich young ruler and he would have say, Tom, Mary, Adam, John, this one thing you lack, what would that one thing be? This rich young ruler, he pointed to his riches and said, you need to sell it all and give it to the poor and come follow me. What is that one thing that God is putting his finger on in your heart tonight? What is that one thing that is a lesser love in your life that's become the preeminent love in your life that's taken place of God's love in your life? God wants you tonight. As the pastor said at the beginning of this service, you're not here by accident. This is a divine appointment, and God loves you so much that he's putting his finger on your heart tonight, and he is showing you what you need to confess and repent of that has taken his place in your life. Listen, you may be here tonight and you're having marriage problems, and the reason you're having marriage problems is because you're not loving God rightly. And until you love God rightly, you'll not have the marriage that God wants you to have and that you can have for the glory of God. You're having problems, other problems in your life with other people, maybe your children, maybe your parents, and it all comes down. When it really the rubber meets the road, what is it that we're letting take God's place in our life where that we are consumed with that instead of God? Because when we're consumed with God, we don't have time to think about ourselves because we're thinking about God. And we can die to ourselves, and we can humble ourselves, we can get rid of our pride, we can pour contempt on our pride as we focus on the cross, as we focus on our Savior. What is that? look like for you tonight or maybe you're here tonight and you're like this rich young ruler and you've come to the service tonight and you're thinking to yourself what do I need to do to inherit eternal life what do I need to do to get to heaven and God is showing you here tonight what you need to do is trust in Jesus Christ and trust in him alone not your works not your goodness nothing else that Jesus Christ came 
as God in flesh upon this earth, to keep the law that you could not keep, to live the life you could not live, to satisfy God's wrath upon the cross, to take your place as a substitute for you, for your sins. And maybe tonight God is speaking to your heart and saying, will you trust me by faith as your Lord and as your Savior? Will you make Jesus Lord of your life tonight? Will you accept him as your Savior tonight? Father, I pray in Jesus' name. God, I pray even as you lay this message upon my heart, I pray, God, that you would speak to hearts here tonight. Break our hearts, Lord. Father, this is the last night we have together in this revival meeting. Father, I pray that no one would leave this building, Lord, without confessing. Lord, if there's some lesser love, some idol in their life, something you pointed out in their heart that is taking your place, some sin, Lord, I pray tonight would be the time of confession and repentance, turning from it and turning to you. And God, if there be some here tonight that are lost without Christ, I pray tonight, God, that you would grant them the gift of faith to trust and believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior tonight, and tonight would be the day of salvation for them. Have your will and way, I pray in this invitation time. And I pray and I ask these things in Jesus' name. I want us to stand as the pianist plays tonight. And I'd ask you tonight, if you need to come to the altar and make this prayer altar, altar of surrender. You say, God, I want to love you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. God, I've let lesser loves creep into my heart and take place of my love for you. Folks, you want to have revival? This is where the rubber meets the road, right here. This is it tonight. And God is putting his finger on something in your life. Will you come right now? Just step out and come right now. Just come. Mom, dad, teenager, young person. You say, preacher, yeah, God put his finger on that in my life. God showed me that I've let sports, I've let television, I've let money, I've let my career, I've let something else take his place in my life. These are coming. You come, church. Will you come? The Holy Spirit is speaking to you tonight. God is drawing you to himself. He wants you to get that right tonight. Sir, ma'am, young person, if you don't know Christ tonight, will you come and let somebody take the word of God and show you from the word of God how you can know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior tonight? Will you come? Will you come, Mom, Dad, teenagers? These are praying. It's not too late. Step out right now. Come. Come tonight, please. Sir? Ma'am? Sir, you'll never love your wife rightly until you first love God rightly. you never, ma'am, love your husband rightly until you love God rightly. You'll never be able to be the parents that you need to be for your children until you're loving God rightly. How about it tonight, church? Search your hearts. Will you search your heart tonight? Will you search your heart? Will you come? Well, no, come with me. I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. Jesus, I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to some here tonight just to totally surrender your life to Christ tonight. Some of you may be in ministry, may be as a missionary. I don't know what that might be, but God is speaking to your heart tonight. These are praying. It's not too late.
our heads are bowed, it's not because the night's the last night. And it's not because some preacher, because I don't believe a preacher can, stand in the pulpit and beg you to come to Christ. If we could, we would. <laughs> but as our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, I really feel led to say this tonight. You need to choose, and the choice is yours. You need to make a choice here tonight. It's a matter of life or death. It really is for somebody here tonight. I, I wouldn't be saying it. It may be that you don't know Jesus as your Savior. It's a matter of life or death. It's a matter of, of hell or heaven. The choice is yours. Am I right? The choice is yours. There's someone here tonight, and your family is in the balance. The choice you make as the spiritual leader of your home, sir, would influence your whole family. You've got to decide, as Joshua of old, he made a choice right in front of all of Israel. He challenged them. But he said, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. What is your choice tonight? Before we leave here, because everybody's fixing to exit this building, and you're going to choose to have received Christ or rejected Christ. You've chosen tonight whether to have a full and meaningful life, a fulfilled marriage. That's your choice. You say, oh, no, preacher, uh, there's too many problems in my marriage. Let me tell you something, folks. There is no problem you're facing tonight that God can't handle. His grace is greater than all your sin. And why do marriages... Why do marriages go down? Why, do they why are they destroyed? Because of sin. That's the bottom line. It's sin in the camp. You say, oh, no, it's the man I married. It's the woman I married. No, it's both of you. Both of you have made choices that have brought you to the place that you are. Now, we're going to sing one stanza to this song. And I'm going to ask you to make up your mind tonight who you're going to serve. Choose you this day whom you will serve. There's a lot of idols out there, and we're bowing down to them, and we can't have it both ways. You're either going to love God or you're going to hate God. You're going to serve God or you're going to be filled with your own selfish pride. Yes, say it like it is. The choice is up to you. God's given you that choice. I'm going to give you one last opportunity to step out tonight. I guess they'll have the words up on the screen if you don't know them. But it's a powerful little song. I have decided to follow Jesus. Let's all look and we'll sing one stanza. I've decided. You come. This is the last part of the invitation.